A law passed in or by Oregon lawmakers back in 2019 just took effect this month. What takes five years to get up and running? Cage-free eggs, of course. Oregon has been issuing cease and desist letters to numerous small farms and market gardens, effectively shutting them down. Using satellite technology, authorities pinpoint these farms and notify them of the prohibition on their operations. The stated rationale behind these actions is to conserve water resources and safeguard groundwater. However, concerns persist regarding the necessity and fairness of these measures. Join us as we examine the implications of Oregon's crackdown on small farms and its potential consequences for agricultural communities and beyond. Not wildfires, but wild letters on Oregon farms. Although some people believe that this occurrence is not so strange in Oregon, it is still important to address the issue because a lot of these things slightly start in some of these states and then spread to other states. They use two different laws to this effect, both of which will be mentioned alongside just to put the situation into context and for better understanding. Small farmers are under attack in Oregon, which has begun shutting down family farms throughout the state en masse under the guise of water conservation and groundwater protection. Yanasa TV, a project of Yanasa Amaranch, shared a roughly 20-minute video explaining what is going on in the Beaver State as bureaucrats invalidly labeled small family farms as concentrated animal feeding operations, or CAFOs, to shut them down for the environment. The rancher in the video explained that Beaver State has effectively closed small farms and market gardens on a large scale. They are sending out cease and desist letters to farms, using satellite technology to find their victims, and sending them these letters that say they can't operate. CAFO stands for Confined Animal Feeding Operation, but Oregon State is starting to twist the narrative to their taste. Government demands too much from the farmers. The rancher explains that there are two different laws that Oregon officials are using to conduct these shutdowns. One involves the Beaver State's broadly vague definition of a confined animal feeding operation, which reads, in part, as follows. Oregon defines CAFOs as the concentrated feeding or holding of animals or poultry, including but not limited to horse, cattle, sheep, or swine feeding areas, dairy confinement areas, and poultry and egg production facilities where the surface has been prepared with concrete, rock, or fibrous material to support animals in wet weather. Based on this definition, a few acre homestead with pasture, probably two milking cows, and some chickens qualify as a confined animal feeding operation if it has any area on the property where rock or gravel is used as a pathway to get to a small barn or coop. The way that they have redefined CAFOs is going to impact nearly everybody. The rancher warns about Oregon's updated confined animal feeding operation definition which impacts his property as well. Even on their properties, they don't have animals that are necessarily contained in one area. They are roaming on pastures. Back in January 2024, a lawsuit was filed on behalf of small family farms throughout Oregon, arguing that the definition of a confined animal feeding operation is too broad and negatively impacts pretty much anyone who produces eggs from backyard chickens, no matter the size of their property. The case was recently covered by National Review, explaining that Oregon's government joined forces with the large-scale dairy industry to oppress and tyrannize Oregon's small farmers. This law is being enforced in the Salem metropolis, the rancher continued, telling the same story as National Review about Godspeed Hollow Farm in Newburgh, Oregon, which has been reclassified as a CFO simply because it has a gravel pathway from the milking machine to the pickup station just 100 feet in distance. Oregon has already closed some farms. There is an injunction on some of the definitions of the law until it can be heard in court. Currently, a lot of what they are requiring is simply too much for the small farmer. Even a toddler would agree that a natural source of water is free access to all the Earth's inhabitants. However, Oregon State begs to differ. Farmers are limited to only rainwater. Another thing Oregon farmers are having to deal with is the state's rules on water. The only water that farmers are legally allowed to collect in Oregon is rainwater. Everything else, including water from rivers and streams, and even groundwater on private property, is considered a public resource. Because of this rule, Oregon farmers are not even allowed to use water from their private wells to irrigate their crops and hydrate their animals without a permit. Coupled with the CAFO rule, this one concerning water use is being abused in such a way as to make it prohibitive, if not impossible, for farmers to run their farms. This rule went into place back in 2021, which just so happens to have been implemented at a time when everyone was being distracted and traumatized by the Wuhan coronavirus or COVID-19 pandemic tyranny. Since then, it has slowly rolled out to the point where market gardeners on a half acre of land 
are now receiving cease and desist orders saying they can't water their gardens and they should figure out another way. The obvious goal in all this is to concentrate even more power and control over the food market into the hands of just a wealthy few while depriving small farmers of their livelihoods and incomes. Not to mention their natural right to grow, produce, consume, and even sell the fruit of their labor for sustenance. Best believe that if this kind of thing can happen in Oregon, it can happen everywhere. The tyranny usually starts in one area as a test case, and if the general public does not resist, it spreads like a virus elsewhere. Americans, no matter what state they live in, have a constitutional right to food freedom. Perhaps you are wondering what brought about the establishment of CAFOs in the first place. Well, here you go, the beginning of CAFO. In the decades following World War II, the production of meat in the United States began to shift away from small-scale on-farm production towards large-scale industrial production. This shift was driven by the confluence of several factors, including increased consumer demand, improvements in animal husbandry, the availability of antibiotics, and mechanization of agricultural production. Concentrated animal feeding operations, CAFOs, are defined by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency as animal feeding operations with numerous animals, over 1,000 animal units, that equal to 1,000 beef cows or a smaller number of other livestock types, are raised on food that is grown elsewhere and shipped to the operation and who remain confined indoors for over 45 days at a time. CFOs now represent the dominant model of livestock production in the United States, particularly in poultry and swine production, where according to the Environmental Protection Agency, land and labor needs to raise animals have been substituted with structures and equipment, increases in animal production in concentrated conditions, concentrated animal feeding operations, or CFOs, were made possible by increased production in their foodstuffs, namely corn and soybeans. Increased production of grains came as a result of the industrial manufacture of fertilizers, as well as the mechanization of agriculture and other factors. Modern commercial agriculture in the United States rewarded economies of scale, such that the larger the operation, the greater the savings in terms of purchasing equipment, feed, managing labor costs, and so on. This was true for row crop production, as well as in the production of livestock. Increasingly, as only large operations were able to return profits to the operator, operations had chosen to specialize in the production of only one or two commodities, a shift from farms raising multiple types of crops and multiple species of livestock. This specialization contributed to the benefits of economies of scale. A single type of feed, a single type of equipment, and other gains were amassed when a farm chose to focus on a single product. As farms had specialized and livestock production had become more concentrated in large operations, distinct spatial patterns of production had emerged. Beef cattle production was largely focused in the Midwest and West, due in large part to beef cattle's need to graze on pasture for the first part of their lives before being switched to a grain-based diet in feedlots. Swine production was located primarily in the Midwest, close to the sources of grain that comprised the majority of the diet, and in the coastal plain of the Southeast where land was flat, relatively inexpensive, and where residents may have lower economic and political power to advocate against CFOs. Broiler chicken production was more widely distributed, but the top chicken producing states were Southern, which include Georgia, Alabama, Arkansas, North Carolina, and Mississippi. In the top chicken producer companies, such as Tyson, Purdue and Pilgrims and Sanderson Farms were also located in the South. This area was sometimes known as the broiler belt. Dairy cattle were raised primarily in the Northeast, Midwest, and along the Western coast of the US. The crowding of larger numbers of animals into more concentrated spaces, where pasture or forage land was replaced with feed brought directly to the animals, presented greater levels of risk of the spread of infectious disease to an entire herd of animals. To combat the constant risk of infection, and to increase the speed at which animals gained weight, livestock and KFOs were dosed with sub-therapeutic levels of antibiotics, typically mixed in with the feed and available over the counter, rather than by a prescription from a veterinarian. Contents of manure that pose risk to water quality include antibiotics, bacteria, and other pathogens, heavy metals, nitrogen and phosphorus, and the like. CFO operators must supply manure management plans indicating how the waste produced by animals would be processed and then distributed into the landscape as fertilizer. Different forms of livestock production produce different amounts and types of animal waste. 
Poultry production resulted in poultry litter, a relatively dry mix that was found on the floor in broiler chicken, turkey, and other types of poultry barns. Beef cattle production resulted in drier forms of manure that were periodically scraped off the ground of the feedlot. Swine waste was often more liquid than beef or poultry waste. This liquid manure was held either outdoors, in pits dug into the landscape, also known as lagoons, or in pits under the swine barn. Waste in these pits was treated to meet environmental requirements for its release into the broader environment. Storage of manure and subsequent application onto fields could not be within set distances of drinking water wells or surface water sources. Increased intensity of hurricanes and other natural disaster events was predicted in the coming decades due to global climate change. A major feature of recent hurricanes has been heavy and prolonged rainfall led to extensive and unprecedented flooding. The Gulf Coast and the Mid-Atlantic were the areas of the continental U.S. hit hardest by hurricanes. During the 2017 and 2018 hurricane seasons, nine hurricanes or tropical storms made landfall in the continental U.S. and Puerto Rico. Surprisingly, this is not the first time such an issue has happened in the state as they closed down a huge dairy production farm in 2019. The shutdown of a mega dairy, an estimated 30 million gallons of cow manure awaited cleanup on the former site of Lost Valley Farm, a mega dairy in Boardman when it was sold in February. The mess was an accurate symbol of the year-long invested tenure of what had been the state's second largest dairy. Lost Valley was closed by the state in early 2019 after repeated violations of environmental rules. And as a consequence of its sale, farm and environmental advocates urged passage of a bill that would issue a temporary moratorium on similar operations. They argued that the state had failed to consider the broader economic and environmental impact of these large-scale producers. The bill would make Oregon the first state to take such an action. The state's dairy industry, a powerful economic force that accounted for more than $500 million worth of milk production in 2017, opposed the measure. The industry had donated over $1 million to state lawmakers in the past decade. Oregon dairy production had also been on the rise, largely due to the arrival of mega dairies like Lost Valley. The debate over the moratorium revealed a state in flux over which direction to steer its dairy industry. In addition to establishing a moratorium on new dairies with more than 2,500 cows, Senate Bill 103, which was introduced in January, would require studies on the economic impact of mega dairies on small and mid-sized dairies, set up an animal welfare task force, and mandate more stringent air emission and water use rules for large dairies. It also would classify such dairies as industrial operations, which would eliminate their protection from nuisance lawsuits under the state's right to farm law. Two other bills that would modify oversight of mega dairies were also being considered by the legislature. Ivan Molusky, policy director for Friends of Family Farmers, an Oregon farm advocacy group, said they needed some serious reform so something like Lost Valley does not ever recur. When Lost Valley was closed, Pictures showed cows standing up to their knees in manure. Nearby residents were concerned that their drinking water could be contaminated by the waste. At a March 21st hearing on the proposed legislation, many people testified in opposition. The opponents, including several farmers associated with the Oregon Dairy Farmers Association, argued that plenty of regulations already apply to dairy operations. They said Lost Valley was just a case of one bad operator who was ultimately pushed out of business as a result of mismanagement. Every dairy operator is required to comply with a myriad of regulations, said David Yamamoto, a Tillamook County Commissioner, who testified against the bill at the hearing conducted by the Senate Committee on Environment and Natural Resources. The cost of regulatory compliance is not free, he continued. The Tillamook County Creamery Association which produces Tillamook brand dairy products, is located in Yamamoto's district. Opponents also argued that the bills represented an enormous threat to the economy of Tillamook County and the vibrant dairy economy, according to State Senator Betsy Johnson, whose district covers part of Tillamook County. Thousands of jobs depend on the dairy industry, they said. Moratorium advocates argued at the hearing that something must be done to reform the system that permitted Lost Valley owner Greg Tavell to go into business in the first place. When Lost Valley opened its doors in 2017, Develde hadn't yet secured all the necessary permits. 
Soon after it began operation, manure from the dairy's 15,000 cows overflowed from storage lagoons and flooded into the cow stalls. Though State Department of Agriculture regulators threatened to sue Develda and shutter the farm, they allowed the dairy to continue operating after the incident, as the Oregon Live reported last year. Ultimately, Develda racked up $200,000 in fines and more than 200 environmental violations. Many Oregonians vocally opposed Lost Valley well before it opened. During a public comment period in 2016, the Oregon Department of Agriculture and Department of Environmental Quality received thousands of comments opposing the mega dairy. Of 4,147 comments, only 15 supported permitting the operation. Residents were concerned about water contamination, especially given that the farm site was located in a region that the DEQ had given a special designation due to nitrate pollution. Commenters were also concerned about air quality, animal welfare, and worker safety, among other issues. But department officials deemed these concerns to be beyond their scope. Despite public concern, regulators moved Lost Valley through the permit process quickly. Emails among state officials demonstrated that they were aware of the gaps in Nivaldi's paperwork, and despite his missing permits, they aided in fast-tracking his application. Environmental and other advocates said this series of events showed that systemic reforms were needed to adequately regulate Oregon's mega dairies. This is not just an issue of one bad actor, Molusky said. The agencies bent over backward to give Lost Valley a permit in a highly suspect manner. Asked to respond to the call to reform the permitting process, a spokeswoman for the Oregon Department of Agriculture only confirmed that state regulators consulted frequently during the Lost Valley permitting process. The department also said that the site's cleanup process was still underway as 30% of the manure solids and 40% of liquid manure, processed wastewater, and collected stormwater generated by Lost Valley Farm had been land applied or exported. The moratorium proposal came as Oregon dairy farms were in sharp decline. In 1992, Oregon had 1,900 farms with dairy cows, according to United States Department of Agriculture data. By 2006, that number cut down to 720. In 2019, the state had 228 dairy farms. This trend was mirrored in several other states. Molusky said that just in the past two years, 20 dairies had shuttered. He linked those closures to the rise of large-scale dairies in Oregon and elsewhere in the Northwest and Midwest. He said there was a glut of milk on the market in part because they had got this new wave of mega dairies all over the country. Those mega diaries were overproducing and they were driving small farmers out of business. On the contrary, milk production in the state has risen dramatically in the past two decades, signaling that the remaining dairy farms house many more cows. The state's largest dairy, Three Mile Canyon Farms in Boardman, had 70,000 cows. Such large-scale operations had the potential for a greater environmental impact. Advocates also sought more rigorous regulation of air emissions from these increasingly large dairy farms. In 2017, the state legislature considered a bill that would have regulated air emissions from dairies, something that had been called for since 2008, but it failed. Meanwhile, federal and local reporting requirements for air emissions from large livestock farms had been effectively dismantled in the preceding two years by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and Congress. The issue of water and air contamination was a major discussion point at the March 21st hearing. Amy Van Son, an attorney with the Center for Food Safety, said CAFOs were the biggest source of nitrate contamination and air emissions controls were desperately needed. Yet the dairy industry remained opposed to any legislative changes that would rein in the expansion of mega dairies in the state. In part, the spike was linked to the growth of the state's dairy exports, which totaled $88 million in 2015. The U.S. exported nearly 15% of its milk production in 2017. The dairy industry is a major donor to political candidates in Oregon. Three Mile Canyon alone had donated $218,000 to candidates since 2006. As the Oregonian Oregon Live reported in February 2019, Oregon ranked sixth in the country for political donations from the farming sector, as well as first in the country for donations from the soda and grocery industries, second for the restaurant industry, and third for food processing. Because of its loose rules on corporate giving, Oregon ranked first in the country in per capita corporate money in politics. 
The idea of moratoriums on new or expanded large-scale livestock operations had been floated in other states. A union of farming and environmental groups supported a moratorium on new large-scale animal operations in Wisconsin. A county in Indiana passed such a moratorium in 2018. In Iowa, 70 organizations signed a letter urging the state's legislators to pass a moratorium, but the bill died on March 8th. As for Senate Bill 103, it would have to move out of committee by April 9th, or it would be dead for that session. Another operator, Washington-based Easter Day Farms, has already purchased the Lost Valley site for $66.7 million. Verily, there is more to the Beaver State than dairy disagreements, the most uncommon facts about Oregon. Oregon has lots of love for llamas. In fact, one-fourth of the country's total llama population lives here. Oregon has more ghost towns than any other state in the U.S. There are over 60 of these ghost towns, including deserted gold mining towns. Crater Lake is the deepest in the U.S. and was actually pooled in the remains of a volcano. The Simpsons was shot in Oregon. In 2012, creator Matt Groening finally put the debate to rest by confirming that the beloved show was filmed in Springfield, Oregon. Most of the Hollywood film, The Goonies, was also shot in Astoria. Portland's name was decided with a coin toss. Had the coin landed on the other side, the city would have been named Boston. Portland is home to the annual World Naked Bike Ride, in which over 10,000 naked cyclists participate. That makes it the largest of its kind in the world. Portland is also home to the most strip clubs per capita than any other city in the States. In Portland, it is not allowed to whistle underwater. The Salem metropolis has one city named Sisters and another called Brothers. Oregon also has a town named Boring, which is the sister city of the Scotland town of Dull. They even have their state holiday called Boring and Dull Day. Although it is illegal to buy and sell marijuana in Oregon, it is still legally allowed to smoke it on one's property. In 1994, the very first wiki website was created in Portland. Ministers in Marion aren't permitted to eat garlic before beginning a sermon. If you enjoy fishing, be careful what you bring as bait because it is illegal to use canned corn as fish bait in the state. Portland and Bend are the only cities that have an extinct volcano within their boundaries in the contiguous U.S. The Caves in the Oregon Caves National Monument were discovered in 1874 and were carved completely out of solid marble. The Beaver State doesn't have a sales, liquor, or restaurant tax. In 1843, the same year as the Oregon Trail migration, the fax machine was invented by a Scottish mechanic named Alexander Bain. A maximum of two people are permitted to share a single beverage in Stanfield. The Tillamook Cheese Factory is the biggest in the world. Proving that their eco-friendly ways are not a trend, Oregon was the very first state to ban the use of non-returnable bottles and cans way back in 1971. The Carousel Museum in Albany houses the largest collection of classic carousel horses in the world. If you own a home in Beaverton, you need to purchase a $1.10 permit before you can install a burglar alarm. Even the Starbucks baristas and Target cashiers have master's degrees in Portland. The city has more literate residents than any other U.S. city. Portland is also the only major city in the U.S. to have a dormant volcano. If you have ever heard the phrase, don't take any wooden nickels, then you have Bend, Oregon to thank for that. When the only bank in town closed in 1933, Ben printed their money on wood. It is still considered legal tender and worth a lot more than its face value. So, contrary to the general saying, you should accept wooden nickels. Get your fill of sausages and giant pretzels in Portland as the city has over 70 food carts or truck vendors, making it the best in the world for street food. The Columbia Gorge Interpretive Center in Oregon holds the largest collection of rosaries in the world. Portland has the highest percentage of white people in the U.S., over 70% of residents are white. The world's oldest teenage drag queen pageant is held in Portland. You'd be surprised that's a real thing. Oregon was home to the world's largest log cabin, built in 1905 in honor of the Lewis and Clark expedition. It was a half acre in size that was until it burned down in an epic fire in 1964. Furthermore, Oregon's state flag is the only one in the country to have different designs on each side. Oregon is for lovers, as her birthday is on Valentine's Day, February 14, 1859. The Malheur Wildlife Refuge is home to the largest freshwater marsh in the U.S. 
The historic Columbia River Highway, also known as the King of Roads, was designated the first scenic highway in the U.S. and is a national historic landmark. Letting an attendant pump your gas is mandatory. You may not pump your own in Oregon, except in rural areas and at night. The self-serve rural gas legislation took effect on January 1, 2016. Nearly half of Oregon's total area is forested, close to 30 million acres. Oregon was nicknamed the Beaver State because early settlers used to trap these animals for their fur. Experts disagree on how Oregon got its name, and there are many theories. Some think it could have come from the French word Aragon, meaning hurricane, a term used by French explorers to describe a super windy area of the state. Others believe it may have been derived from the Chinook word Ulagan, a type of fish these Native Americans ate. Do you think it's right for Oregon to shut down the farms of its farmers? Leave your opinion in the comments. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel for more interesting videos. Thanks for watching.